thank you for speaking with me. This documentary was very eye-opening. There were so many different emotions that I went through. So I want to know what was it about this subject and this topic that you felt this is needed right now today? Thank you. Um, I'm assuming that was for me. <laughs> um, nice to meet you. Um, well, it's actually really um, unbelievable kind of timing, you know, that the film is being released right now. Um, but we've been working on it for a few years. And um, so I, the urgency, you know, from our perspective was, was always was always there. Um, you know, the film was was conceptualized more in the wake of the first Black Lives Matter movement and the Take a Knee protests. And so, you know, we we're already kind of seeing so many of these horrific videos um, of Black men being murdered. Um, and, you know, for me, I had, I had made my first film about school segregation. So I was really kind of looking at our education system and the inequalities and the segregation um, that really marginalizes students of, of color. Um, but I was also, you know, seeing so much of this violence on the news and, and really asking myself, you know, why, <laughs> frankly, why white people weren't more outraged um, and seeing these murders happen. Um, and not only just, you know, in the, you know, 2000 teens, <laughs> um, but it's been, you know, going back from the history of our entire country and, and white people have been witnessing, you know, um, the deaths of, of black people and black men in particular, um, and, and not really showing a lot of outrage and not taking to the streets and not, you know, demanding reform. So, so that was a question for me long before, you know, George Floyd and the events of this summer was um, kind of where's, where's the outrage and, and why don't white people care more when black people die? And, and that was really kind of a question. Um, why, why were white people not more in support of the Take a Knee movement? You know, why was there such a backlash among the white community from the Take a Knee movement? And so, um, you know, it just, it, 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 it happened that the, the summer, you know, really brought it to a lot more people's kind of consciousness. Um, and so we're hopeful that there's more receptivity to this message now. But for us, the urgency has, has always been there. This is something our country, you know, has been dealing with for 400 years. And um, it's, it just gets more urgent every single day, but it's always been there, you know. From both of you, there are a lot of topics that is discussed in this documentary. Can you talk about the process of choosing which to focus on? Um, well, for, for me, the, um, you know, the sort of premise or the hypothesis of the film is really looking at the humanity of, of black males and, and really, you know, co connected to the question of, of, you know, why, why don't white people care more was this question I, I started asking myself, do we not see black men as fully human? Can we not see their full humanity? And, and looking at the way that black um, men and boys are depicted in the media, um, looking at the sort of exploitation of black um, men's bodies, which Howard, you know, can speak to really uh, much more eloquently, but the, you know, the exploitation of black men's bodies for sports. So I really wanted to create something that would explore more of the humanity of black men and boys that we don't often see since they're often, you know, entertainers and sports players in, in mainstream media. Um, what is the emotional landscape? You know, what is the spiritual landscape? What is, um, what's going on inside? Um, and so creating something that looked at the mind and the voice and the hearts and, and this sort of full spectrum, as we say, um, and, you know, mind sort of looks at the education, but also trauma and these things that are happening, you know, voices, activism and things like take a knee, but, but also owning your narrative and, and, and um, you know, changing your story and, 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 and being um, able to speak out for what you believe in. And then heart is really about belonging and love and the thing that we all need, which is to feel connected and to feel accepted. Um, so that was sort of how it was structured. But um, I'd love to hear Howard's point of view as well. Well, thank you for having me on this. I, I played an incredibly small role in all of this. I'm very, just grateful that the um, it was nice to meet Sonia and Chad and her t and their team.
and everything. And I felt like when they had first approached me to have um, opinions and thoughts on what was taking place, uh, where we are in the country, I actually thought it was very valuable to have another perspective. I thought it was very valuable to think about where we are from the people who are talking. I, it's a really important question to say, who gets to tell your story and how much of your story do you have say over how much of your perspective? Are you simply the person who gets asked questions? Do you, or do you have an opportunity as well to shape what your narrative looks like? And I think in, in so many instances, especially in sports, the narrative is not shaped by the people who are doing the playing. The, the people who are doing the entertaining are there for the entertainment. And I thought what made this project valuable was it allowed the, the people in the, in the universe of, of, of sports in general and, and also in society to have, a, uh, to have a more active role in letting the world know how they viewed their surroundings and how they viewed their life instead of just being chess pieces. I thought that was really the, the, the real value to the, the film, as, as Sonia said, the sensitivity, the humanity, the, uh, the, the, the being more than simply a, a subject, um, and especially these days, a subject on the news as, as something that, somebody that something happened to instead of someone who's actually living a full life. So I was wondering for you though, when you see the documentary and it's done in its entirety, do you feel that this is something that it is talking to all communities of, despite their color, or is this for a certain community? Is that for me or for Sonia? For both. Um, well, I you know, really wanted to create something that would also would speak to everybody. I mean, humanity, we, you know, to connect us and our, and our humanity for sure. Um, you know, I, when I was making my first film, um, Teach Us All About School Segregation, I would get questioned a lot, especially from white people. Why are you making a film about segregation? That's a black issue. And my response would be like, no, this is, this is an American issue. Like you don't have to tell black people that segregation is a problem, but, but white people either don't notice it or don't seem to think it's a problem often. And so it was really interesting that that was, you know, people would say that's a black issue. And, and I would say it's not a black issue. Black people did not create it. <laughs> black people are not in charge of dismantling it. And so it was, it was, similar with this, you know, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't think, you know, I can't speak for black people. I don't think you have to tell black parents that black boys deserve love, but unfortunately you do have to tell white people. Cause if you look at the way that, you know, black boys are treated in our system, there's not love there. There's not compassion. There's not respect for their humanity. And so, um, you know, I really wanted to make something that would speak to everybody. I mean, especially America at the point that we are right now. I mean, hopefully it has a global message as well, but particularly for, for our nation where we're at right now, it, it, the intention was to create something that would um, foster more cross-racial dialogue and would really be um, open up conversations that we often have in silos that we often don't have together and we need to be having together. Um, so that was the purpose from, from me and um, but Howard, what do you, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of felt that, um, well, when you first contacted me, I think we talked about this first, I think it was in 2018. And uh, yeah, 2018, 2017, 20, 2018. And, you know, when you were first conceptualizing this, and when we were talking about it, and we actually did the interviews, I felt that the one of the areas of, of interest that I'd had in, in this was when you were talking about the taking a knee movement, whether it was Colin Kaepernick or whether it was the players with their t-shirts or the WNBA for that matter, for anyone taking an interest in this, uh, this social movement that sort of has resurrected the political voice of the black athlete, which really had been dormant since the 1960s. What I found interesting about it was how, how much the black athlete was a commodity, just how much your, the, all of what they they did was shaped through their ability to generate revenue and if they had done anything or suggested anything that threatened that revenue they were easily discarded or ridiculed or attacked or whatever and you see that and this is one of the the, 
the, the parts of my work that I really try to concentrate on, which is the, the why of why is advocating for a black position a death sentence, a professional death sentence? Why, you know, why are so many of these um, encounters with law enforcement, and there are so many encounters that people have with law enforcement every day, whether it's jaywalking or a parking ticket, why is the potential in this instance, why is it always so deadly? What is the root behind that? Why is, when, when you get stopped by the police, very, very few people um, are thinking about this being potentially their last day on earth, unless you're black, then it's first in your mind. And this is something that deserves a, a great deal of, of attention. And I think that the reason why the film is, was important to me is because it stretches that, you know, when you're looking for that answer, it's not always a policy answer. It is, as Sonia said, it's a humanity answer. It's a sensitivity answer. It's a, it's a what am I here for? Am I here, to, if, if I'm here to work for you, if I'm here to generate revenue for you, if I'm here to entertain you, no wonder you don't think I'm a person. That's, and, and to me, that is one of the, the great tensions of the film. And it's also the, you know, probably the best, the greatest level of humanity in the film. Well, for both of you, I was wondering this. It, it shows how, you know, we are all human and we are all one and, you know, entertainers, yeah, I, we can entertain you, but treat us as human as well. The question is, we've had protests. We've had the, the marching. What is it more that you feel needs to be taken for simply just stop killing us? Yeah. Tony, you want me to go? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think for me, I, I don't necessarily, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is to that. Um, I don't know if there is an answer that I could provide because I'm not the one doing the killing. Right. Uh, so th sometimes these questions are directed to the wrong people. You know, we ask the questions, like when you want to know about racism, we always ask black people about racism. We say, well, we're not the ones who are actually perpetuating this. We actually live it. To me, I, I think that I've, I've always taken the position that, um, the areas where you, I think the areas where you feel the most threatened or where you feel the most hopeless in the country as an African-American male to, to me is when people assume that the very, very basic tenets of everyone else's lives don't apply to you. And I think one of the sweet things that I liked about the film, and it bothered me, I'll be honest with you, there are parts about the film that really made me uncomfortable. And I think sometimes that's a good thing. But um, I was angry in a lot of ways because it was a, um, you know, to look at the sweetness of a father playing with his child. This is a normal, basic, uncontroversial thing. The fact that people look at this often and see this as some sort of triumph or that you see it as some sort of um, example of exceptionalism really bothered me. At the same time, it was also nice to see it. It was also nice to see these things that we know exist because I'm a father, my son is down the hall. You know, th these are things that are very, very basic. And so it's a question of who you're trying to reach and, and what, how people get a chance to see you. Um, to me, these things are obvious. To a lot of people, they're not. And I think that the willingness to be able to, to put that out there is, I think there's value in that. Is that go going to increase or improve training <laughs> amongst law enforcement? So when these things happen, they're not going to look at you and shoot you in the head? I, I can't really speak to that, but I can say that as a viewer and as a participant, there was something that I really, really enjoyed about being normal. I thought that was nice. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I think for me, the, you know, recognition that what we don't talk about, like sort of the, the thing that <laughs> nobody wants to touch is, is this idea that we've been very conditioned to fear black men. 
And if you fear black men and boys, then you're not going to be able to love them. And if you don't love them, then you're not going to be able to change the systems that marginalize and oppress and you know dehumanize them. And so I think for me, it was because we know how to do education right in this country. We do it for white children. We know how to, you know, humanely treat people for the police force. We do it for white people and especially for white women often. And so I think it's not that we don't know how to do these things. Not, it's just that we, it's that there's not the, the, the will there to, to do it. And, and that was the question for me is why isn't that there? And that's when I started really looking at this issue of fear. And if we, we aren't willing to talk about the fact that we're, we've been brainwashed from the beginning of this country to fear black men, that's what's getting in the way of being able to love them and look in their eyes and, and see them and, and, and notice, as Howard says, in, incredibly um, non-remarkable things like their fathers, you know, and their sons and their, and these, these things that are not at all remarkable, they're completely commonplace, but for white people, we don't see it, you know, it's not reflected in our media, what's reflected is things that perpetuate the fear. And so what we're trying to create is something that, that, you know, starts to, I mean, or contributes to um, this, this sense of love and the sense of, you know, curiosity and openness and compassion and, and just, you know, conversation and dialogue um, um, with, with black men, black boys in particular, that have been so separated from, you know, mainstream white culture. And that's why I think this country is in the state that it's in, so. Yeah, I see, uh, and I, I agree. And I think there's something else worth considering too. I think the concept of fear is a very real one. When you're thinking about fear, and especially over the last 20 years and post 9-11, America, we live in fear, we're taught to fear, where when you think about the ingrained fear pre 9-11, you are conditioned to fear black people, right? You're conditioned to fear black men, especially. And now in this era, over the past 20 years, what is the first thing? What do people say? If you see something, say something. That's that new post 9-11 thing. Well, what are you going to see? And what are you going to say if you're already afraid of black people? So now you've heightened that fear. So when you see things like Amy Cooper immediately calling the police in, in New York City, when you see this idea that you can, you know, all of these viral videos about seeing somebody black doing something, you know, whether they're barbecuing in the, you know, at Mer Lake Merritt in Oakland or whether or not they're selling water on the sidewalk, then you immediately call somebody. And so this heightened level of fear in the if you see something, say something era increases the danger and increases the possibility of violence against black people because you've already been taught to fear us. So now the danger is even more prevalent. It's even the potential for it is even more obvious and more deadly. And so this is a, it's a counter to that. And, and I think there is value in that. Thank you so much for speaking with me, both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> that was great talking. <laughs>